Well, thank you for your giving. We're going to dismiss the children to Children's Church at this time. We'll ask the rest of you to stand as we share together the statement of our faith. Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our scripture reading then is the same as last week's and will be the same through the Christmas uh, seasons, at least the Sunday mornings. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18, uh, and reading through chapter 2, verse 4. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the, peop all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. Thank you, Lord, for your word. We continue to worship you as we consider it. Open our hearts to your truth. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. In our text for this Christmas season, the child who was born to Mary was given four names or titles. They are in order, Jesus, Emmanuel, King, and Christ. And last week, we looked at the name Jesus. You shall name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And this morning, we consider what it means for this child named Jesus to be called Emmanuel. What does it mean that Jesus is called Emmanuel? Well, that second title given to Jesus is found in verse 23. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. He is not only Jesus, the one who saves from sin, but he is Emmanuel, God who has come to be with us. And to see that at this time of year is to see one of the greatest, one of the most profound of all of the Christmas realities. Now, in our text, the angel, as he speaks to Joseph, quotes from the Old Testament. He quotes from the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14. And the events of Isaiah, chapter 7, take place during the reign of King Ahaz, who was king over the nation of Judah. It happened about 700 years before Jesus was born. Uh, you remember, not because you were there, but because you have read about it and you've heard about it, that after King Solomon died, the nation of Israel was split. And it wasn't really split in two. 
there were 12 tribes and 10 of them went one way and two of them went the other. Israel, they kept the name of the nation. They were the northern kingdoms, 10 of the tribes, and the, uh, the southernmost two um, in the south, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And they existed, kind of coexisted in somewhat guarded friendship for, uh, uh, for uh, quite a lengthy period of time, a thousand years or so. And uh, sometimes they were at each other's throat. They plotted against each other, but uh, still kind of had a, a coexistence every once in a while when it served one of their geopolitical interests, they would help the other one out. But it wasn't a good situation. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, what, uh, it wasn't an ideal situation. Let's just put it that way. The Northern Kingdom, if you want to get a sense of the spiritual temperature, the Northern Kingdom became apostate pretty quickly. And even though there were prophets that spoke to them, uh, their revivals there were, uh, were kind of tepid, not a lot going on. The Southern Kingdom was at times true to God. Uh, and it was in that Southern Kingdom that Isaiah prophesied. He was a preacher to them. And at the time of this statement, when Isaiah spoke to the king about this child called Emmanuel, again, the king's name was Ahaz. Ahaz was the grandson of one of Judah's great kings, uh, a man by the name of Uzziah. Most of us know the uh, Uzziah because of that, that well-known passage uh, when you know, Isaiah said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord uh, high and mighty lifted up, high and holy lifted up. His train filled the temple. Well, Ahaz is Uzziah's grandson. And uh, he was not a godly king like his grandfather was, at least most of the time. Uh, Uz uh, Ahaz filled Jerusalem again with idols. Remember, even though the uh, southern kingdom of Judah was smallest, was the smaller of the two kingdoms, they did keep Jerusalem. And in keeping that, they kind of had the mother load. They had what was uh, that thing that was most important. And Ahaz had filled Jerusalem again with idol worship. Uh, he reinstated the worship of the pagan god Molech. Now, this is, a, this is one of those mornings when I'm really glad that the children have gone off to children's church. Because whenever you look at the, uh, at the conquest of that land as Israel was coming in, uh, one of the reasons that they were instructed to just push the people out of the land and to wipe them out was the worship of a god by the name of Molech. And they had at that time this, this large image, and it was made of iron. And uh, uh, and Moloch's, Moloch's hands were like this, and they were made of iron. And beneath it, there was a vat that they would, that they would heat up uh, to, a, to a great degree. I mean, so you could hardly get to it. And they would sacrifice their children by placing them fully alive in these hands, which essentially cooked the children. Now... difficult topic to deal with as we've just hung the Christmas lights, and all I can say is Jesus came to redeem us and to change us from those sorts of practices and those sorts of, uh, those, uh, sorts of gods that they worship. Ahaz participated in that, and not only did he bring that back in, uh, Ahaz was a truly despicable man and he sacrificed one of his own, own sons to Molech. The only thing that was going for him, the only thing that people would have applauded was that he happened to be in the Davidic line. He was a descendant of King David. And in that, he had a measure of protection because God was going to do some things through the Davidic line that uh, irrespective of how good or bad the kings happened to be. 
This is a dark, dark period in uh, the nation of Judah's history, 700 years before Christ was born. The king of Syria and the king of Israel, that northern kingdom, had at this time allied together and they sought to remove King Ahaz and replace him with a puppet king that wasn't of the Davidic line. You see, the kings up north, they always knew that somehow the people were a little uncomfortable because their kings weren't in that Davidic line. They, didn't, they weren't a descendant. It's the kings from the south that were of the Davidic line. And so one of the ways that the north could monkey with the south is kind of delegitimize them, take the Davidic king off of the throne. And so the nation of Israel, they had allied with Syria, and they were going to try to remove King Ahaz. Remember, just a terrible guy, but he happened to be a descendant of King David. They wanted to replace him with a puppet king who would uh, be more to their liking and, again, would delegitimize the king of Judah. In the face of such a threat, Ahaz decided to strengthen his hand, not by turning to God and saying, oh, I see that we've gone down the wrong path, but he decided to make another alliance. And so he, he turned to the king of Assyria, a guy with the melodic name of Tiglath-Pileser, and he said, uh, let's ally together and you can be my protector. We're not going to ask God for protection. We're going to ask Tiglath-Pileser for protection against Syria and the northern kingdom. Now, the Assyrians, uh, they were pretty tough customers at this time. At one time, they had invaded and devastated the northern kingdom of Israel. Four times, they had overrun the southern kingdom of Judah. But now, Ahaz reasoned that with Assyria as his defender, he would buy himself safety. And Ahaz, to get this kingdom and to get Tiglath-Pileser to agree, plundered the temple of all of its silver and gold, which had been dedicated to the worship of God, and paid off Tiglath-Pileser. And so God sent Isaiah to confront King Ahaz and to tell him not to trust the Assyrians, but to trust in God. Now, again, it might seem odd that God was going to come to the rescue of King uh, Ahaz, but there were bigger things afoot than King Ahaz. People sometimes come to me and say, because every once in a while you'll see a situation where God seems to work through a bad guy. He, he just does. God is sovereign in that way. And uh, he will work through bad choices and bad decisions, just like he sometimes works in good decisions. And people will come, and they want, look, you want an ordered world just like I want, right? I want all of our decisions and faithful decisions to work out wonderfully and in the short term so we can see them. And we want, uh, we want evil people's decisions to just, just destroy them, right? And be a clear... Uh, we want all the church-going Christian believers to be to prosper and have everything go right. And there's something about us that says, wow, how is it? It's a common complaint. Why are the unrighteous successful? Well, God has purposes in all of those sorts of things. And so he comes to have a, uh, a little conference with Ahaz through the prophet Isaiah. Well... Ahaz, even though he was a bad guy, was actually a pretty insignificant player. Ahaz was thinking that the issue was his life and his kingdom. What was actually at stake back at this time was God's purposes for the world. Ahaz's judgment would come, but for now, God was going to show himself sovereign over the affairs of men in the protection of his people, even in the protection of a pretty bad guy. And the text from Isaiah says, 
again the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. Notice here that in the text, uh, it equates Isaiah speaking with the Lord speaking. Isaiah here is speaking clearly the words of God. So God has come through the person of Isaiah and said to Ahaz, hey, uh, I want to be the one who rescues you. I don't want uh, King Tiglath-Pileser of Assyria to rescue you. So why don't you ask me for a sign that will show you that that's exactly what I'm going to do. And Ahaz, who really, honestly, one of history's all-time greatest weasels, decides at this particular time to take the high and kind of holy road by saying, I will not ask, I will not put the Lord to the test, as if his entire life wasn't putting the Lord to the test. Uh, this is Ahaz at his spiritually, biblically ignorant best. He's trying to sound righteous, but he fails utterly. You see, the command to not put the Lord to a test was a command against unbelief. And in refusing to ask the Lord for a sign, Ahaz was basically exposing himself as an unbeliever. He didn't believe that God was going to rescue him. Remember, because he wasn't seeing God, he was seeing the prophet Isaiah. So the word of the Lord came through Isaiah. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Therefore is used because Ahaz has refused to ask for a sign. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. He will call him Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the right, uh, to, to reject the wrong and choose the right. But before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid to waste. The lands of what two kings? The northern kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Syria. The Lord will bring on you and your people, on the house of your father, a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. Uh-oh. So the king of Assyria is still out there, and that's not going to be good. Now, the prophecy is a little bit difficult to understand. We're not told everything about its fulfillment in the time of Ahaz. But this is essentially the prophecy, and I offer you my paraphrase. See if you can hang with what's going on. What Isaiah says to the king Ahaz is, Ahaz, at this time, you are being threatened by two kings, and you fear for your life. So here's what I want to tell you uh, to give you confidence that uh, God's going to save you, and you should not ally with Tiglath Pileser. At this moment, Ahaz, there is a young woman somewhere in your kingdom who is a virgin. She is going to marry, and she is going to give birth to a son. Now, let's be very, care very, very careful here. What this does not mean, it does not mean that there's going to be a virgin birth, right? What it means is there is a girl who is going to be who right now is a virgin, and she's going to get married. She's going to marry, she's going to give birth to a son, and she's going to call him Emmanuel. By the time this child reaches the age of accountability, or is bar mitzvahed, this is a Hebrew, Hebrew context, the two kingdoms that you fear will be, will be nullified. So, in the time it takes for this girl, who is a virgin, to be married, have a son who lives to the age of 12. Sometime in this 12, 14 years, you're not going to have to worry. You don't have to make an alliance with Tiglath Pileser. You don't have to worry at all because the, king of, the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Syria are going to be wiped out. So rejoice. But, Ahaz, you're not a good guy, and uh, you're not going to like the situation much better because 
then Assyria is still going to be at your border because they're the ones that are going to destroy Israel. And when you see those things unfold, Ahaz, it will be good for you to reflect upon the meaning of the boy's name, Emmanuel, or God with us. That's the Old Testament prophecy. It has been said that we play checkers, but God plays chess. He works in infinite ways and infinite levels beyond us. And in this prophecy, there is a near meaning for King Ahaz. And then there is an ultimate meaning that is the promise of God's faithfulness and that we talk about at Christmas time. Now, as Isaiah speaks, and then as he writes down this prophecy, it's not possible for us to know all that Isaiah believed about the future. Uh, it's not possible for us to know at this point whether he believed that there was going to be a future fulfillment of this prophecy, where God takes this one prophecy and then expands it out into the future. Isaiah doesn't know that. Now, the things that Isaiah did believe, Isaiah did believe absolutely that a Messiah was on his way. He knew that God was going to send one. Isaiah knew that the continuation of the Davidic kingship was absolutely crucial. But that may be about it, those two pieces of information. 1 Peter 1, chapter, or chapter 1 verse 10 tells us that the prophets would have loved to have been able to see and understand what the people in Jesus' time saw. But they didn't. They only knew little parts. They shared parts of their puzzle that God had given to them. They did not always have that ultimate meaning. Now, in the near term, Isaiah was absolutely right and knew what was going on with that short-term prophecy. The future? Not sure if he was able to connect up his belief in a Messiah with this prophecy. Isaiah didn't have exhaustive knowledge of how his prophecy would be used by God at a later time. But we know. And now we know from our perspective God's full intention in the prophecy. We know exactly what God meant even though Isaiah probably did not. Remember, it's not Isaiah's prophecy. It's God's prophecy. And so God gave Isaiah this portion of it, and later on, as the angel speaks to Joseph, he begins to fill in the rest. So as Matthew recounts the story of the angels meeting with Joseph, and the announcement of the child to be born, he looks back to the time of Isaiah, and the threat at that time that was coming against the Davidic kingly line, and led by the Holy Spirit, Matthew sees a greater fulfillment of what God is doing now in the person of this child, Jesus. He makes the connection, under the prompting of the Holy Spirit, that the promise of Emmanuel, first given by Isaiah, was now going to be completed, was going to be fulfilled in a child who would be born of an actual virgin. That's what's going on there. People have debated and they've talked forever. A couple of years ago, I preached, I think, my favorite Christmas sermon. I keep wanting to preach it again, but I can't re-preach it because I just did it uh, on the virgin birth. Absolutely crucial, absolutely crucial to Christian faith, the virgin birth. And people have made the arguments, well, back when Isaiah used it, it was, you know, the, the word for virgin could also be used for young lady. Absolutely. It meant a young woman who at that time was a virgin, she was going to get married, she was going to have a child, and there we go. It's, it's one of those extra little twists. It's profoundly important, but it's part of the wonder of Scripture that as Matthew writes and the Holy Spirit directs him, he uses that same word, and we wouldn't know for sure 
that it was actually the prediction of the virgin birth until Mary, in her conversation with the angel, as he says, you know, you're going to have a child, and Mary says, how can this be because I have never known a man? And you go, oh, isn't it wonderful when a biblical plan comes together? And you see the way that God has worked it all out. Okay, I, I thought I would get at least like one muttered amen. Berto, you're falling down on the job, my man. That's, that's pretty good. Uh, I love that. Um, what was the meaning of Emmanuel? In Isaiah's day, it was that God was going to faithfully keep his promise to his people, and he was going to preserve the Davidic line a while longer. Uh, he wasn't going to abandon them to be torn apart by Syria and by the nation of Israel. He was not going to allow his promises to them to fail. There were other things that had to be done before the Davidic kingly line was going to be set on the shelf for a while until the Messiah, Jesus, would bring it back. In Matthew's day and in ours, it does mean this. It means that God is intimately concerned, and he can show up as he wants. And in Isaiah's time, sometimes it was periodically, but now it means that he's with us all the time. It now means for us that God has become a man. It means that God is present with his people. It means that the child that was born that day, though fully human, was also fully God. In the Old Testament, the presence of God was in the Old Testament tabernacle or later the temple. And now in the New Testament, the presence of God is first, or was first in the body, the person of Jesus. And now available to all through his spirit, God with us. Emmanuel, then, is a powerful Christmas truth. I want you to listen to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. We have flesh and blood. So he took flesh and blood. We share in the same common physical elements. He added to himself our flesh and blood in order to die the death to save us from our sins. But there's a little more. If you read further in that second chapter of Hebrews, Hebrews 2.17, he had to be made like us in all things. He had to be fully human in every sense in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. A priest is someone who intercedes for you. He's, he's someone who goes to God for you. And how can he go to God for us and plead our case and ask God to help us if he doesn't really understand us? So a priest was always chosen from among men who could pray for the needs of other men because he knew what they were. So the scripture tells us that Jesus became one of us in order that he might represent us as our faithful high priest before God. And verse 18 says, because he himself suffered when he was tempted. I want to just stop for a second. Because he, Jesus, himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. He knew temptation, and he knew testing, and he knew suffering, and he is Emmanuel. So when you look at the child of Christmas, you have to know him as Emmanuel, or you have missed the point, or a, por a significant portion of the point. He's God with us. And so in his life, he was thirsty and he was tired, and he was sleepy, and he learned things, and he was glad and sad and angry and grieved, and he was troubled, and he was disappointed, and he was tearful. He was overcome by the prospect of future events. Are you overwhelmed by the prospect of future events? There's a couple of times in Jesus' life where that was true. He was faithful, but he was overcome by the prospect of future events. He exercised faith. He read the scriptures. He prayed. He sighed with an aching heart. He felt everything. Do you suffer? His hands and feet were nailed to a cross. Are you in danger? His life was in danger 
was bookended by danger. In the flight to Egypt, and then his crucifixion. You say you've been mistreated and misjudged? So was he. Emmanuel means to us that our God is not far from us, and that he's certainly not indifferent to our plight. Every time that you have felt decidedly alone, and that God wasn't paying any attention to you, and he could not understand what you were going through, I was wrong about that, and so were you, because God knows our hurts, and Jesus knows our weaknesses, and he's not only the Emmanuel of salvation, but he's the Emmanuel of sympathy. Most of the time in Scripture, when we read Scripture, the references to Jesus or the Christ, rarely is he called Emmanuel, because Emmanuel is a, def is a definition. It's the essence of who Jesus is. His name is Jesus, and when you see him, he proves that he is Emmanuel. That's kind of the way it works, right? His name is Jesus, and when Jesus shows up, he shows up as Emmanuel. With that being true, then, what is the message of Emmanuel to all of us? I think at least three things that I would pull out this morning, and I'll do so briefly. First of all, Emmanuel means to us that God keeps his promises. It also means that nothing can keep him from keeping his promises. You can depend upon him. No matter your challenges, God is greater. You may not understand his ways, and you may, in moments of despair, think that he has forsaken you for the moment. But that's just our perspective, not allowing us to see God's greater picture. He's with us. Second, God has things under control. He truly does. Ahaz was trembling. He was trying to make every alliance that he could think of. And he thought he had the big one. I'm going to ally with Syria, and they're going to protect me. Ahaz was fearful for his life, and God was not disturbed at all. And notice, neither actually was Isaiah, as Isaiah is having to confront Ahaz, because Isaiah had a word from God. There is an inevitability to God's triumph, regardless of appearances. I want to say that one more time because I'm not sure if we hear that as, uh, as often as we should. There is an inevitability to God's triumph no matter what circumstances you may see. There are world crises on every hand. And it doesn't matter in the last hundred years or the last – I'm trying to look at the oldest person here. It might be 92. There have been world crises in the newspaper since that time. Economic, immigration, geopolitical. I've heard people say, it seems as if everything is spinning out of control. And to those people, what I just want to say is Emmanuel. Emmanuel works in these situations. The world is not actually spinning out of control. There may be things going on that you don't like. But Emmanuel, God is with us, and God does not ride in sinking ships. He just doesn't. My future is not in my economy, and it's not in my status. It's not in my nation. My future isn't even in this world. My future is in God. There we go. And third, Emmanuel also comes, and this is a this it kind of takes us back to King Ahaz. Emmanuel comes to us as a rebuke for lack of faith. I'll, I'll end this more positively, but I do want to just stop here for just a moment. You see, it couldn't have escaped Ahaz's attention. Well, maybe it did because he was a really bad guy. But it shouldn't have escaped his attention that Emmanuel, God with us, also meant to him, buddy, you have turned from God and trusted in yourself and the unholy alliances that you can make, but God cannot be escaped, Emmanuel, God with us. Emmanuel is a comforting, comforting thought when you're on really good terms with him, but it's a disturbing thought when you're not. But comforting or disturbing, the Bible presents this, and I believe this with all my heart, that this is a reality. 
And so it must be taken into account. And all of us must deal with that. God's attitude toward the world is one of redemptive love. How can I come? How can I save it? God did not send his son to terrify the lost, but to save them. And that's true. He did not send us a son to push us away, but to call us home. That's the purpose of Emmanuel. Yesterday, I had a really good time, actually, decorating here for Christmas. And I love the de decorations of the season. I wish we had more. The de Christmas decorations just kind of add life, and they add a little bit of joy. But honestly, the sympathy and the salvation that I need at the core of my being are not, even though I love Christmas trees and lights, it's not in that, and it's not in our kind of stories that we tell around the Christmas season, and uh, the jolly gentleman dressed in red, who I, I, lo I love the story, by the way, uh, great Christian roots to it, and I like the gifts he brings, let's just be honest. Go with me on that. But honestly, for the deepest needs of everyone's heart and life, whether or not you are a follower of Jesus or not, for the very deepest needs at the very core of our being, what we need is Emmanuel. Let's stand. Thank you, Jesus, for coming our way. And thank you for being our friend. Thank you for giving yourself for us. Thank you for redemption. Thank you for eternal sympathy. Thank you for love. Thank you for salvation. Emmanuel, the best gift that we can imagine. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Go with God. But don't go too far because we're going to gather in about five minutes for church elections.